Good morning, Grace. Church is starting. We are here. This is happening. It's so good to see all of you. My name is Haley. Welcome to everyone here in this yard. Thoroughly social distancing. Yes, face your chairs apart so we keep our germs off of each other. Um, welcome everybody online. It's good to see you too. I bet you want to be here right now and we wish you were here too. Uh, we're moving closer towards being able to worship together. How are, you, how are you doing this week? Can I get a feel for you? How's your week? Okay. I had a hard week, and I had a really hard morning, and I just feel <laughs> today. So, <laughs> But I could not wait, honestly, to get here and worship Jesus with God's people, with all of you, just to lift him up and rest in him. Um, it's just I love God. I love Sabbath rest, and I'm so excited for what the Lord is about to do in our midst here. Um, there's lots of ways to connect through the week. Small group is happening. Uh, small groups are happening. We're meeting in backyards, social distancing. Youth group has been going on. There have been a lot of kids at youth group. Am I crazy? Like, there are so many, especially boys. Youth group is happening. They're meeting in parks. It's awesome. Yes. Hi, youthies. <laughs> So there's lots of ways to connect. If uh, We have our prayer ministry, um, our prayer Wednesday morning dude prayer, the guys meet. And then we have Thursday morning Zoom prayer at 7 a.m. So if you want to be a part of any of these things and you're not already, make sure you click on the virtual prayer card. And I will get you connected with all the right places. We still are um, praying every week for all the prayer requests that come in. So if you have prayer needs, click on the virtual prayer card. You can do it after you leave this place too. Um, just log on and onto Facebook, click on the virtual prayer card. And we are, everybody that is praying over those prayer cards is still praying every week. Last week, I actually didn't have any and I felt sad. I love to pray in the morning for those prayer requests. So make sure you fill that out. You can still give online, click on the giving link. It's a joy to give to the Lord and to his work. And we should still keep doing that during this season. Um, oh, if you haven't checked your email from Sam, Sam sends out an email every week and we're updating our uh, church directory through Breeze. So make sure you respond to that email and get all your information connected. Okay, that's all the announcements I have. And now I'm going to pray. I just want to pray right now. So bad. Will you join me? Lord Jesus, what a, an awesome honor it is to come together and worship you in unity. Lord, we need unity. Bring unity to us, God. Thank you that you are someone that we can agree on. And you are our king, like we've been talking about in our small groups. Jesus, you are king. You are king of creation. You are king of our hearts. You are the soon coming king. And you are worthy to be worshipped. All of heaven worships you. And your praises rise up from all over the earth right now and all day long. And God, as your heart, as your eyes are searching for hearts who are looking up at you, as you search this place today, Lord, search our hearts and may our eyes be found looking back at you. Would you find faithfulness in this place, God? You see into our hearts. You see the things that we can't see. You see all the brokenness and you see all the potential. And here we are, Lord, today. We humbly, humbly bow before you and ask that you would just take over just be our king and lead us. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place this morning. For everyone who's watching at home, Lord, help us by your spirit just to lean in a little bit more. You are so faithful. You are so patient. You are so willing to take a little bit of humility and do something crazy radical with it. We love you, Lord. You are worth our time. You are worth our heart. You are worth our devotion. You are are worthy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Have your way in this place. Amen. that all the dark won't stop the 
life from getting through what we do do you wish that you could see it all I invite you to stand as we sing this morning. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of
to a world beyond, to a life of love away, with a beating heart, and a simple silent faith, safe within your arms, quiet by the light of grace, there in the cradle of life. You held my breath Here at the table of wine and broken bread I find all I need You are all I need In the air I breathe In the joy of being Hidden in time to the life ahead you are all I need you are all I need when I'm lost in joy in a timeless song of praise you're the sacred voice singing purpose God, we, that is our prayer this morning. That is our, that is our song this morning, God, that there's nothing we need apart from you, God. That our satisfaction, that our hope, that our joy would be in you. 
that we wouldn't look to this world to find our security, that we wouldn't look to this world to find our peace, but that we would look to you, God, our Lord, our Savior, our rock. God, you are all we need. Pray, God, you'd open our hearts this morning to your word, that you would open our hearts, Lord, that you would work through your Holy Spirit to convict us and to draw us closer to your Son. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. This is weird. Um, speakers for the first time in six months. So we are going to be finishing our uh, kind of mini-series as we've been reading through the Gospels. We've been covering the character of Christ. And so what we're going to do today is finish up the character of Christ and kind of transition into... Um, the epistles, or the writings of, you know, the apostles. And so what we want to do today um, is, again, remind ourselves of the fact that w- we view the Bible as authoritative, and if we view the Bible as authoritative, we have to ask ourselves, authoritative for what? Right? Authoritative to um, determine our morals? Um, hopefully not. It, hopefully it's not that simple. What we've been talking about is the idea that um, we're crawling up inside the story of the scriptures so that they would crawl up inside of us. And so the idea behind that being that we view the scriptures as authoritative and out of that authority, we view the scriptures as formational, right? They have the authority and the ability to change us. And so that's what we've been desiring to do as we read through the scriptures together, as we preach through the scriptures together, as we walk through the scriptures together in our small groups. Um, we're doing so with this mindset. We're, we're entering into the biblical story so that it might have its effect on us and change our lives. Now, one of the th- issues that we run into with this is that um, most of us, if we look at ourselves and we look at those around us closely, we tend to not see a ton of change. Right? I mean, we all have our stories of change, but for the most part, day to day, I think if we were honest, we could all raise our hand and say that we're frustrated by our lack of change. Uh, As we read the scriptures, as we pray, as we follow Jesus, more often than not, we're frustrated by our lack of change, right? Most of us are not walking around all day, every day, like, I'm just so excited about the changes I'm seeing inside of myself. Those things, those days happen, but the majority of our days are spent frustrated at our lack of change. Um, frustrated at that besetting sin, that one thing that's frustrating us that doesn't seem to leave, um, that one thing or those two things or three things or four things, six, you know, some of us are sinners or all of us. Um, but what, we, what we're attempting to do as we look at the scriptures and as we specifically look at the gospels and look at the character of Christ, we're doing so through the lens of, of Christianity, knowing that who Jesus was, the life that he lived, and who he presented himself to be, he did for us. And so Christ's righteousness, we believe, that through his death and resurrection has been given to us. And so we, we live in this frustration that we aren't what we want to be, while also hopefully holding on to the fact that we don't have to be too frustrated about what we want to be and our frustration over not being able to be that because Christ was that thing for us. So as we walk through this last sermon on the character of Christ, we are going to look at Jesus as Lord and Savior. And specifically, we're going to look at a change that we see in his disciples. Okay, like we're, we're talking about this idea of formation, spiritual formation, uh, being formed by the Gospels and specifically being formed by who Jesus is, if we're looking at the Gospels, right? We can look at the life of the disciples, the men who left everything behind to follow Jesus, and we can see a change happen. And so I want to just zero in on that as we make this transition out of the Gospels, all right? Um, What we see in in this transition in the New Testament is this idea uh, that Jesus is Lord, Okay, we're all here today because Jesus is our Savior, right? But there's this idea that we see as we transition out of the Gospels that Jesus is more than just our Savior. He's also Lord, 
And if we're going to understand what Lord is, we have to understand what Lord is, right? Um, in Acts chapter 1, well, come back a little bit. In the Gospels, there's the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. The night before Jesus is crucified, he goes to the garden with his disciples and says, hey, why don't you guys um, pray with me, right? And what happens? Multiple times. They fall asleep, right? And he says to them, why, you couldn't pray with me even how long? One hour. You couldn't even pray with me one hour. Fast forward a few weeks in Acts chapter 1, what are they doing? Before Pentecost, right? Before the Holy Spirit comes down like fire on top of them. In Acts chapter 1, it says they're gathered together in one accord. And what are they doing? They are praying. It says they are devoted to prayer. Something happened between Gethsemane and Acts chapter 1. Something radical changed. Now we know what happens in Acts chapter 2. Something really radical changes. That, that those of us that are raised Baptist aren't, still aren't comfortable with 2,000 years later. Right? <laughs> super, super weird. Okay, but something happened be- between Gethsemane and Acts chapter 1 to where the disciples who couldn't stay awake for one hour are now gathered together. And Luke actually says they're gathered together with all the women, right? Because remember, Jesus is the friend of women as well, not just the 12 dudes. Uh, they're gathered together with the women and they have devoted themselves to prayer. So there's a change that's happened that we're intended to see. Because Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts, back to back. He wrote them as letters to the same guy, and he's telling us this story, a continuing story from the Gospel of Luke into the book of Acts. Now, uh, Peter specifically, right? What happens to Peter the night that Jesus is crucified? Denies him three times. Denies that he even knows him, right? People are like, hey, weren't you with Jesus? As Jesus is getting beat over here, and Peter's like, I don't don't know the guy, right? Starts cussing people out. And then in Acts chapter 1, what's he doing? Preaching boldly and 5,000 people are getting saved. Something happened. Something happened. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 3 and 4. But before we do that, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2 really quick. All right? So Acts chapter 2, we have Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit comes. There's uh, like there's a, a rushing wind. Everybody's speaking different languages. And it's like this this is supernatural, radical thing that happens when the Holy Spirit comes and fills them. And then Peter preaches a sermon declaring who Jesus is and what happened in the resurrection. So Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So he's saying like, um, Jesus did all these things. And the power that he did them, the power that he had to do these was from God. You know this, right? That's my paraphrase. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This is a really interesting text because Peter says uh, he was delivered up, how? According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So he says, God planned this to happen and you did it. He's holding the sovereignty of God and the the moral responsibility of man together and holding them out for them to see. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Now, jump forward to verse 32. This Jesus, God, raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So Peter's preaching now, having spent uh, between three and four weeks with the resurrected Jesus. With the resurrected Jesus, he watched him die on the cross and then, three days later, spent three to four weeks with Jesus, right? We are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So this is at Pentecost, right? Things are happening and, and Peter's going, ah, this is what Jesus was talking about. This is the promise that Jesus said when he said he's going to hen- send us the helper. It's happening right now. And Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit and he's preaching this to the people. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord. So God the Father says to my Lord. That's a really, really interesting thing that Peter just said. No longer is Jesus teacher and rabbi. Now he's Lord. There's a shift happening. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your 
footstool. So Peter is quoting Psalm 110 that Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter 22 on the Sermon on the Mount. And Peter's recognizing what Jesus was saying and he's preaching it to the people. Verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. Lord and Savior. This Jesus whom you crucified. He keeps reminding them that they did this. He keeps reminding them that they're the ones that killed Jesus. Verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the heart of the gospel message, the declaration of who Jesus is and how we should respond. Who Jesus is and how we should respond. Now, let's talk about this idea of Jesus being Lord. The term sounds royal to us, and it probably should. It sounds old-fashioned to us, and that's okay too. Um, so here's where it comes from. The idea, this, this, the idea of this word Lord comes from Greek, which comes from Hebrew. The idea, when you read through your Bible and you see the, lo- the word Lord in all caps, if you translate that, like, translate that back to the original language, that's Yahweh. That's That was the Old Testament name that the Hebrews knew God as. That was his name. But they also were afraid to say it out loud. It was too holy for them to say with their sinful human lips, they believed. And so they substituted the word Lord. And if we look at a literal translation of that word, it's Adonai. Adonai is the the literal translation of the word Lord back into the original languages. So, They didn't want to say God's real name, so they called him Lord, which is the phrase Adonai. So if we look at this idea, or if we look at this word in the New Testament, 740 times in the New Testament, the word Lord is used. Almost exclusively speaking about Jesus. 740 times. Almost none of those are in the Gospels. I think three. So there's a shift that's happening. There's a change that's happening you guys are all wishing you brought your sunglasses, huh? <laughs> That's why I kept backing into the shade. Um, almost exclusively, this term is used for Jesus after his death and resurrection. So when we look at the Gospels, we see other terms for him, rabbi, teacher, his name, right? We're going to get into that later. But after his death and resurrection and ascension, he is called Lord. There's a change that happened in his disciples and in those that knew him and believed in him. There's no more confusion about who Jesus is. Right? Peter was getting there in Matthew when he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He got part of it. Now he fully understands, as we see in Acts chapter 2. All right, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 6. John and Peter are in Jerusalem near the temple, and they encounter a lame beggar. In verse 6, Peter says, I have no silver and gold, But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So they're walking by the temple. There's a lame beggar on the side of the road. And Peter says, I don't have any money, but I got something better. Get up and walk. Verse 9, all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with awe or with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, right, the guys that healed him, he's clinging to them. All the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Okay, he pr- breaks into sermon again, spontaneously. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at this, at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for the murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name. You see, he's preaching the same sermon. Right? Us pastors tend to like, have this pressure that we need to be creative and different. And Peter just says the same thing over and over again. You know, Jesus, you killed him, but he came back to life. I saw him, I'm a witness, and everybody goes, oh my gosh, what do we do? Like, 
true. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, and to this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. He calls them to repent again. So it's super disruptive, giant crowd. What happens? They get arrested. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, right, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. 5,000 people got saved because Peter said, you killed Jesus. So why did they get arrested? Here's what they did, okay? Let's just be really clear and honest about what Peter and John did to get arrested. They healed a guy, right? I don't think it was a crime. Kind of awesome, right? And then they preached a sermon and, th- and a bunch of people got saved. So why did they get arrested? It says it, right? That because they were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They were talking about Jesus, right? And they uh, annoyed them because they were greatly annoyed. So, verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Where have we seen this scene before? Didn't it just happen with Jesus weeks, weeks ago? Right? He's arrested. They put together a kangaroo court and bring him before it. With Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, the same guys that tried Jesus, are now here talking with Peter and John and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or name did you do this? Okay, it's almost like they're giving them a chance to recant. Giving them a chance to come clean. What power or name did you do this? Now, here's what they're hoping for, okay? Because miracles were not necessarily something that they had, that were um, not a part of their culture. Right? They had the Old Testament. They believed in the Old Testament. They lived by the Old Testament. So they believed in this idea that God did miracles. This is why they had to say to Jesus, you do these things by the power of the devil. Because they weren't, they weren't willing to accept him, but they couldn't deny the works that he was doing. So then they were like, nah, he's possessed by demons. So they're saying to Peter and John, I can't, again, they can't deny the miracle that just happened. There's a crowd of 5,000 people that saw it. So they're asking him, by what power did you do this? And what they're hoping, what they're hoping is that Peter and John will simply respond by the power of Adonai. Right? By the power of Yahweh, which name they wouldn't utter out loud. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined, this is the same Peter that, again, a few weeks before was like cussing people out and telling them he didn't know who Jesus was. Now he's being uh, standing in front of the same court that condemned Jesus to be brutally flogged and tortured and crucified. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit and says, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, there it is again, he won't let him get away with it, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. So there's the gauntlet, right? To us that kind of seems like Peter's, you know, using some cool poetry. What Peter's actually doing is quoting Psalm 118. He quoted Psalm 110, and that got him arrested. Now he's quoting to them Psalm 118 that's talking about the Messiah, God himself, coming to to be with man. And he's saying, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected. He's saying, instead of just saying Adonai, and saying by the power of the Old Testament God that we all believe in as Jews, he's now equating Jesus to, to Adonai. He's saying that Jesus is Adonai. Jesus is Lord. The gauntlet has been thrown down. So real quick, application. 
right? Jesus is Savior, amen? Here's the question that we have to ask. Why is Jesus able to be our Savior? Because he is Lord. Because he is Adonai. Because he is Yahweh. If he's not Yahweh, if he's not Adonai, if he's not Lord, he has no authority to be our Savior. We cannot separate the two. But the problem is that we don't want a Lord. We just want a Savior. Right? We want to be forgiven. We want to have eternal life. We want to have forgiveness, but we do not want to surrender ourselves to a Lord. And we could say this is an American idea, but this is a human idea. We like the idea that we're in control. We do not like the idea that we are subject to the creator of the world and that he calls the shots. And yet this is what we see in Jesus. He is Lord and Savior. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. He leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Okay, who's leading? Who's leading the processional? Jesus is. Right? We, and so we have cheesy songs like, take, Jesus, take the wheel. If we would only live every day this way. If we would only live every day with this as our focus instead of frustrated over the fact that we can't be something that we think that we're supposed to be. Why? Because Jesus is Savior. See, these things go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Look at what Paul says when Jesus appears to him on the Damascus Road. This is Saul, right, who's killing Christians, arresting them, trying to snuff out the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. As he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And how does he respond? Who are you, Lord? You think he knew? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are per persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. That's change. He went from persecuting Jesus to following Jesus instantaneously. Right? This is the change that I think most of us, if not all of us, can attest to. Ian Thomas says that to so many people, the Lord is in danger of being no more than a patron saint of our systematic theology instead of the Christ who is our life. Jesus has become to us an idea that we believe in because we get something from him. He is not our king. Okay, we talked about this in our small groups this week. What, what does it mean that Jesus is king? And we were just like, most of us can't identify with the idea of a king because that's kind of something that used to exist long ago, and now we don't really exist in that kind of culture of kings. But do we understand that Jesus himself is our Lord? He is our king. He calls the shots. We've been talking about this idea of being disciples and following him as our rabbi. We learn from him. He teaches us. Do we also understand that this is not a like, well, I agree with this part, Jesus, but can we talk about this other part? And we'll deal with that later because I think I might disagree with you on this, right? Which is what we do with our college professors as students. We go up to them and we disagree with them and we go back and forth and that's a healthy dialogue. But Jesus is not a college professor. He is much, much more than just a rabbi. He is our Lord. He is the king of the world that created the world. And do we view him as such? Kevin DeYoung says that... Uh, that's what you're saying if, when you confess Jesus as Lord. You're saying, Jesus can call the shots for my life. Jesus can tell me how I should think about myself, about marriage, and about the world. Jesus is the one that has all authority in heaven and on earth. Not me. I am not an autonomous creature. I live to serve the master. That's what you're saying when you call Jesus Lord. And we can say it here, right? We can all raise our hand and say, yes, Jesus is Lord. But then when push comes to shove in our life, 
Okay, let's just go to a fundamental human level. Are we, are we willing to accept what Jesus says to me about myself? Am I willing to accept myself because Jesus accepts me? Okay, forget about sin, besetting sin, all that stuff. Just talk about our humanity. Did Jesus say, I'm going to come, I'm going to die, I'm going to be your Lord and your Savior so that then you can be something better? We're missing the point. Jesus came, died, was resurrected so that we could look at on him and say, he is, as we just sang, all I need. Not so that I can say, okay, now I need to be a good Christian so Jesus will like me. I know he loves me. I know he died for me. But he's disgusted by who I really am. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that we are all broken and we can accept our brokenness and just give it to him because he died for it. Jesus is not only Lord and Savior, but he has a name. Okay? Again, this idea that we do not worship, we do not follow, we do not serve an ideology, but a person. A person. Not a theology. Let me ask you a question. This is a really simple question. Do you love the doctrine of Jesus or the person of Jesus? Do you know the person of Jesus? There are millions and millions of people in the world that know the doctrine of Jesus that do not know the person of Jesus. There's a world of difference. When the gospel writers thought about the Lord, they didn't use lofty theological terms. Okay, what did they call him? Jesus. 600 times in the gospel, he's referred to as simply Jesus Four times he's referred to Jesus Christ, and twice, I said three times earlier, twice he is called Lord Jesus in the Gospels. And I think, you can correct me on this later, I think that both of the times he's referred to as Lord in the Gospels, it's by Gentiles. Okay, he's known simply as Jesus. And so what we see from the Gospels to the book of Acts is this massive shift. They knew him as a person, you guys. We need to know him as a person. Matthew chapter 1, his name is Jesus, and God says in Matthew chapter 1, for he will save his people from their sins. The person of Jesus, not the idea of Jesus. The person. The work of Jesus means nothing without the person of Jesus. He is our Lord. And so this is what Peter is saying when he says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name not no other theology, not no other idea, no other name, no other person under heaven given to mankind, right? No other name of a human being by which we must be saved. Jesus didn't die for something he wants you to be. He died for you. Jesus didn't come to save something that you're supposed to be. He died for you. He died for me. And he is inviting you and he is inviting me to follow him as rabbi, to accept the fact that he is our friend, but also understand that he is our Lord. He is our king. He is in charge. Jesus as Lord and as Savior. What does it mean for us to live as daughters and sons of the king? We have been brought off the street, out of the gutter, into the castle, given royal robes, given new names, made a part of his royal family, and invited to live as such. What does that mean for us? It's a good thing that was my last page. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we ask that you you would cause this truth to bury itself deep in our hearts. Two things. Number one, 
who you are as a person. You are Lord and Savior. And number two, Father, the implications of that for our life, that we would spend our lives marveling at who you are and because of who you are, what you've done. And we ask, Lord Jesus, the the knowledge of who you are and what you have done, as we see in in Acts chapter 1, as we see in Acts chapter 2, would bring about transformation in our lives. As we study who you are and what you've done in your word, Father, that it would truly transform our lives. This is why we're here. This is why we're here, Father. This is why we worship you. We want more of you and less of us. We want to decrease so that you might increase, Jesus. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Matchless in grace and mercy There is nowhere we can hide from your love You are steadfast, never failing You are faithful Our creation is in all of who you are I invite you to stand as we sing this last song You're the comfort, the sick, and the broken you are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. We sing God with us. God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us, God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. Your heart, it moves with compassion. There is life, there is healing in your love. You're the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. We sing, God. Lift him. 
nothing can come against No one can stand between us God with us God for us Nothing can come against No one can stand between us This is how I know I am yours That when my heart should condemn The truth is so much more This is how I know I'm secure That even though I keep falling Your love for me endures in the light of your grace You and my darkness in the light of your grace my burdens lose their weight in the light of your grace. You lift my head up in the light of your grace. My sin is washed away. This is how I know you're my Lord. That in my weakness you give strength to be restored. This is how I know. Tell me I am yours in the light of your grace You and my darkness in the light of your grace My burdens lose their weight in the light of your grace You lift my head up in the light of your grace My sin is washed away you for your goodness this morning, God. We thank you, we praise you for who you are. The God, you are Lord and you are our Savior, Lord. I pray, God, that we would trust in you, God. Not as just an idea, not as just a reason or a way to be better, God, but that we would trust you for who you are. That we would truly know you more deeply, more intimately, God. That we would know the measure of the love that you have for us. God, I pray this week, Lord, in our lives that we would feel your presence. We would see you, God, walking with us each and every day. Lord, that we would not be overcome by this world, Lord, but that we know that through you, that you have overcome the world. So God, I pray, Lord, that this week, God, that we would just lean in to your word, to your presence, to prayer, and God, walk closely with you as our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. And in Jesus' precious name, amen.
join me in a doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May the peace and grace of Christ be with you all this week. Hey, nobody move. I want to get a picture. <laughs> Start into the sun one last time. Okay, I need, I just need Luke and Nicole. Remember, six feet, though. There we go. We got it. Everybody wave. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, next week, I'll...